All right. Um, for those who don't know me, my name's Tony Morris. Um, I live in a city called Brisbane in Australia. It's on the east coast. If you like, put Australia here. It's, it's just on this side. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about zippers. Who's heard of zippers? You've all heard of it. That's why you're here. Who's used them? Cool? All right. My goal today is to try to... Um, I'm going to explain to you uh, the meaning of zippers and I'm going to try to pass on an intuition for why you might consider using that data structure. And I'm also going to do a bit of doodling around with calculus, mostly because I'm bad at it and it's kind of fun to watch me up here try to do some calculus. You'll be entertained. <clears throat> All right. I haven't it yet. That's okay. I owe you a sticker from last year. I've got them in my bag. All right. So, um, just a bit about me. Um, I look after the Queensland Functional Programming Lab. Queensland is the state in which I live. And uh, it's, um, I have a team of nine programmers. And uh, we're sponsored by the Queensland State Government and also um, the CSIRO, which is the Federal Government Research Organisation of Australia. So I look after that team. We do functional programming all day long, pretty much. Um, and we, we get a fair bit of freedom in what we do. Um, our, our goal is essentially um, be awesome. That's it. And we're like, okay, let's get GHC out and be awesome. That's, that's it. So a <laughs> um, little bit more to it, but that, that's generally how we work. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about zippers. A zipper is um, it's a term, and it basically means um, an end hole context into a data structure. So consider any data structure, and we're going to talk about the context within that data structure. And in particular, we're going to talk about one whole contexts, mostly because they're easier to understand, um, but end whole contexts are also useful. So when we talk about a context, like just, just think of any data structure you can right now and, go and like come up with a value of that type and, and go and stand on a part of it. That you're, you're within the context of that data structure. Right, like you might have a person with a name and an age and an address. Go and stand on the address. And you're in, you're in that context. You look around and you see a name and an age. And you look down and you go, oh, there's an address. I'm standing on it. That's the context of the data, data type. So um, one of the uh, key use cases, at least I think it is, is that you can move efficiently through the data structure. So if I said to you in that trivial example, um, move from the, uh, from the address, move to the age, you would just take one step and now you're standing on the age. And you look around and you'd see a name and you'd see an address. Oh, there's uh, an age. I forget where I was up to there, but yeah. <clears throat> so that's what I just said. So just stand somewhere within the data structure, look around and what do you see? This, this is a loose way to think about, or I think just an intuitive way. Um, if you go and open up a textbook on zippers, you're, you're going to see a lot of calculus. Um, and I'll go through that. Um, but this, this is sort of like, a, a, I think, a really good intuition. Um, what's a good data structure? How about JSON? Who sends that across the network? Everyone, right? People send it to me as I'm walking down the street. <laughs> I get like a blob of arrays or something, bang. So just think about this data. You've got this thing and you go and stand and you look around. What do you see? Well, you see like, you know, if you've got an object, you'll see the th things above you, the things below you, the things that way, you know, your children, your parents. <clears throat> so I'm going to use lists as the first example because um, I think it's, it's not too trivial, but um, it's non-trivial enough to demonstrate the point. So here's a list. Here it is. And... And this is meant to be like a physical thing. Like I, I just threw this list out on the floor. There it is. It's made of blocks. And I'm going to go and stand on the number seven. So I do, I walk along and I stand on the number seven and I look around and I see this. I see six, five, four, three, two, one, eight, nine, ten, seven. Right? Do you agree with that? So this is the value that I see. I see a triple. It is, that's six, which is immediately to my left. It's on the head of the list. There's my focus, and that's my right. So my left, my focus, and my right. 
when I stand on this block here. And importantly, I could, I could take a step back to my left. So I'm standing on seven, I take one step. I'm now standing on six. And I see five, four, three, two, one, and seven, eight, nine, ten. I can do that in, in 01 time, right? I can go from seven, I can get to seven. Once from there, I can move, take one step left in 01 time. Now I'm standing on six. And that's called the focus. So this is just a bit of nomenclature, a bit of vocabulary. Um, what we call this bit, the focus, the thing we're standing on. <clears throat> so um, we can move, yeah, there it is. We're move, so we, we move left on our triple. I can write a function from that to that, and it'll be constant time, right? It'll just be peel the head off this list, make it the new focus, and, uh, sorry, yeah, peel the head off this, put that there, and put that one on the front of that one. That's all constant time operation. <clears throat> the zipper for a list of A is the triple of a list of A, and A, and another list of A. You have your lefts, your focus, and your rights. That is the zipper for a list. <clears throat> Let's think of some operations we might want to do. Well, moving left and right takes in a zipper, and it returns a zipper. Maybe. Right? What happens if I'm standing on this block, and I say, move right? I fall off land in Australia. <laughs> also known as nothing. Right, we get, we get no zipper back. <clears throat> we could say something like, um, wherever I am on the, on the list, or on the zipper, wherever I am the focus is, move right until you find the first even number, for example, like I could, the predicate there. Until, move the focus until I find a focus that matches that predicate or maybe I just never find it. So that's another useful operation. I could say, modify my focus, add one to it. All right, so given a zipper and a function to modify the focus, give me back a new zip. And I can delete. Now delete needs maybe, all right? So I could I delete the focus that I'm on and I need to now make one of my left or right the new focus. Maybe there is no left or right. I mean, actually, that should, be, that should actually be delete left or delete right. Because if you delete your focus, you need either one of these or one of these, and they're two different functions, right, to become the new focus. <clears throat> OK. Is anyone unfamiliar with a multi-way tree? OK, that's at least one person. That's OK. A multi-way tree is, um, so it's got a root node, and it has n children. And those n children can also be trees. So then you could have another root node and n children. So think of like a data, uh, a uh, um, directory structure on a disk, right? You got like slash, that's at the root. It's got many children and inside those, they could all have many children, etc., etc. And this is how we'd, we would write it in Haskell. We would say this is the root and this is the children. So we could, we, could, we could write this value of that type. So there's the root, there's its children, and each of these trees has children, and so on. What's its zipper? Well, if I went and stood here and looked around me, what would I see? Well, I'd see siblings to my left and siblings to my right. I might see some children, and I'd see a parent. So, the type of the left siblings is a list of trees. They're my siblings to the left. My right siblings is also a list of trees. The focus, well, that's, that's of the A. It's a tree of A's. My children, well, they're a list of trees. Um, this is one way to encode it, by the way. There's other ways. Um, importantly, you've got to keep context. So, this does keep context as long as your parents are that. So, that is your parent focus and its siblings. So what we want to do is we want to be able to navigate down the zipper, do some operations, and then unfold back out of the zipper 
and the whole context should be kept as we do so. So this data type allows us to do so. This is a tree zipper. Um, this is a tree zipper. Welcome to tree zippers. They look like that. I can do things. I can take, well, what's a good example of a tree? Like, um, I don't know, XML. Who uses that? No, you send Jason now. Well, you know, like you've got a, a, an element and it's got sub-elements and so on. We can walk down there and I can say, twiddle the element and then move to my child, you know, move to my left sibling or something like that, twiddle that one, unfold and come back and I've got a new XML document. For example, this data type will allow us to do that. Some operations, we could say move to my parent or move to my child, maybe, if they exist. I could move to my siblings, left and right. I could do another find to, on my siblings. Um, I could just say, do all of the files in this tree exist? For example, right? Like if I've got a tree of directory or files or something like that. I could modify this thing that I'm standing on. I could modify the entire tree underneath me. If I'm standing on a focus, that means that there's a tree underneath that, right? That's the root node of the tree. Um, and I can insert, I can say, take this value, put, make it the new focus and take the one I'm standing on, put it to the side, make it a sibling. <clears throat> so here's some examples. Um, I wrote this one a, a few years ago in Scala, a long time ago. Um, I wrote this one recently. Um, I'll tell you a bit of story about that. Um, so I work with people. There's another team. They do a lot of machine learning. All right? I don't do machine learning. They just come to me with their problems. And they use Python for some reason. I don't know. Something about you have to use Python. And, you know, or else. NumPy or else. But the CSV is always broken. Right? This, this is what they said to me. Right? I'm, just, I'm just giving the message here. It's always not quite parsable. And, you know, so you know, we, we wrote a parser that you can write corrections for and you get a zipper so you can move around the CSV efficiently. That's what they wanted. For example, um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you ever do flying, um, I do flying, um, and you go into a forum one day, like if it, you know, your, your first day one of going onto a, like an aviation forum will be, hey guys, what's the best pilot logbook? And you know, you can read all the debates, Excel, you know, this and that, and I just come in and go Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody recognize the name? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I'm just being honest. They go, hey guys, what do you use for a logbook? And I go, oh, Haskell with a zipper. Like, what else would you use? <laughs> <clears throat> So um, let's talk about functors and co-monads. Does anyone not know what a functor is? Every person in this room. One person. I saw it. One brave person put their hands up. There's more than one. <clears throat> okay, a functor. So <clears throat> a functor is, um, well, let's just write some code instead of drawing functors in the air. So if I said to you, write me a function of the type, given a function A to B, and then a list of A, return a list of B, you would say to me, well, that's easy. I would turn every A in that list into a B with that function, right? If I've got a list of A and a function that turns A's into B's, return a list of B, to take every A, turn it into the B with the function, return it. Um, I could do a similar one, like maybe. Maybe is a list with a maximum length of one. All right, so go through every A in the, in the zero or one list, turn it into a B, and so on. Um, there's others. There's some, this often makes people's head get a bit burnt, but this is also an example. This is, all right, given a function A to B and then a function T to A, return a function T to B. Well, that's easy. I'm going to take that T, put it in that function, get an A, take that A, put it in that function, get the B, and return it. And these are all following a pattern, right? That pattern is this. Do you agree that that's that pattern? And uh, a bit of hand-waving. There's a bit more to it, but don't worry about it. Worry about this pattern for now. A functor is anything that slots in for F. List is a functor. Right? I can write that function at the top. 
maybe is a functor, I can write that. T arrow is a functor, I can write that. There are some things I can't, they're not functors. But all things that I can are functors. Okay, this function is often called, its name is canonically called fmap. Okay, now we all know what a functor is. Okay, where was I? Don't know, there, right. <clears throat> so a functor is anything that supports the fmap operation, a to b to f of a to f of b. A comonad is any functor, so that is to say it also supports fmap, that also supports this function here. Given an f of a, return an a. Does a list support that function? If I gave you a list of a, any list of a, and I said, give me an a, could you do it? No, I'll give you the empty list just straight off the bat because I'm mean. And I'll say, give me an a, and you'll be like, oh, I've got no a's. You can write that function though. I'm not gonna ask you to do that, and I'm not gonna do it anyway, but you actually can. Um, can you write a function that is uh, like think of it, actually maybe is a good example. You can write this function for maybe, but you can't write this function. So that is to say, given a maybe of A, return a maybe of maybe of A, hand-waving over some other requirements. Can you do that? Well, the answer is yes. You take this maybe of A, and you say, get inside the A and put just around it, and now you've got a maybe of maybe of A. Sorry? Did you wrap the A or did you wrap the F? I wrapped this. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, it's not, the implementation is not just. The implementation is FMAP just. All right, so go inside here, get that A and turn it into a maybe A by calling just. And these are the hand wavy bits. All right, so there's some laws. Um, I'm not going to go into them. Um, this is not about a comonad tutorial. I'm just telling you what a comonad is. All right, so it's anything that has FMAP and supports these two operations, extract and duplicate, they're often called. There's a reason I'm telling you this though. Does a list zipper satisfy fmap? All right, can I, can I write A to B to list zipper A to list zipper B? Yeah, all right. You remember what it is? It's a triple of two lists, my lefts and rights and the thing I'm standing on. You fmap on these two, and you just call the function on my focus. That's fmap. What about extract? Oh, man. Can I write a function of type list zipper of A to A? Yeah? It's the focus. It's the thing I'm standing on. What about given a list zipper of A, return a list zipper of list zipper of A? I would do this um, in order to satisfy these two laws. The way I would implement this is I would <clears throat> take the thing I'm currently standing on, like wherever I am on the focus, I generate all the possible zippers that I can get from this zipper. Like if I do this, this is a new zipper. This is a new zipper. I get a zipper of all the zippers. I can duplicate a list zipper. List zippers are comonads. They satisfy the requirements for a comonad. Isn't that interesting? Yep. Like yeah, they're often called that. So some other, some other terms, this is often called co-pure. Um, What's the Greek one that goes like that? Oh, I can't remember its name. Mu? Mu. N-U. Um, and this is, yeah, sometimes called co-bind or co-join. I think is, actually, I think co-join is more common. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it does. Yes, I can write these three functions. The laws will satisfy. I'm hand-waving over those, but they will satisfy. A list zipper is a comonad. What about a tree zipper? Well, can I fmap a tree zipper? If I have a tree zipper of A's, can I get a tree zipper of B's with a function A to B? Yeah? Modify. Uh, modify has not quite the right type because modify is a function that acts on the same type as my focus. Like it's A to A. It's close though. Like let's go back and have a look at modify. Just, I mean, I think that's a really good comment. Well, it's not quite right, but it's, it's good intuition. Where's modify? Oh, geez, it's a long way. There it is. This is almost fmap, right? It's not A to B to list zipper A to list zipper B. It only modifies the thing I'm standing on. But fmap has to modify all the things, right? Um, actually, that was list zipper, so for tree zipper as well. 
Um, oh, it's there somewhere. <coughs> so I can fmap a tree zipper. Can I extract from a tree zipper? So if I have a tree zipper of A, can I get an A? Yep, it's the thing I'm standing on. It's my focus, right? Where's tree zipper? Oh, I won't do that again. It's back there. Focus is of type A. It's the thing I'm standing on. Oops. So can I duplicate a tree zipper? Can I give you a tree zipper and you're going to give me back a tree zipper of tree zippers? Can you like almost write the code in your head? That's all I need to get you to. <laughs> no? Let's just go with yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> a tree zipper is a co-monad. Tree zippers are co-monads. Actually, all zippers are co-monads. Isn't that amazing? I can say to you, I've got a zipper in my pocket. I'm not telling you anything about it, and you can say it's a co-monad. And you'd be right. So I came up with this like really obtuse example to try and use a zipper. So what we have to do is um, I'm going to write this function. This function says, um, do any adjacent foci of the list zipper satisfy the given predicate? So that is to say, if I'm standing on a list zipper, do any, does anything on either side of me satisfy that predicate? Okay, that's the function that I've just written there. You can, you can read the code and check it works. Hope it does. I write tests all the time. So given this list zipper, does everything, do, do the two adjacent elements on either side of me, if they exist, satisfy that predicate? That's what that function does. <clears throat> Find all the zippers with a focus adjacent to the given value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this list zipper, that is get me all the list zippers from this list zipper. I'm then going to turn it into a list. So, so just like we can go from a list to a zipper, okay, I can go from a list to a zipper and I'll set the focus to the head of the list. So I'll have no lefts and everything else on my right. And like in the list 1 to 10, my focus will be 1, and then 2 to 10 will be on my right and nothing on my left. So I can go from a list to a zipper, and once I've finished doing all the things on the zipper, I can go back again to a list. I, I would reverse everything on my left, put it on front of my focus, and then append everything on my right. I'm back to a list again. You can do the same. So that, that's what two lists will do. And I'm going to filter with that function that I just wrote. And so now it looks like this. <clears throat> that is, um, sorry, can I just go back there? Yeah, so given a value, find all the zippers with a focus adjacent to a given value. All right, so if I said to you, give me all the zippers where the next thing on either side is three. You've done this before in your text editor. I bet you have. You've done something like it. You said, give me all the positions in my source file where, I don't know, there's a capital letter on either side or something like this. As you're editing away, then you wrote a vim binding for it or something like that. So there's the code. I duplicate it, I convert it to a list, and I filter with that function. Isn't that amazing? I can just make a zipper of zippers. <clears throat> so in this list zipper here, where my lefts are 3, 2, 1, I'm standing on 4, and 5 to 10 is on my right. Find all with the, with, uh, that are adjacent to 3, right? Well, the zipper where the focus is 2 satisfies that. And also, the zipper where the focus is 4 satisfies that. All right, so I'm running the function now. I would argue that this is what text editors would like to do. And again, there they are. I did. I ran it. Me. I've wanted all sorts of arbitrary zipper operations. I want to do things like, if today is Tuesday, move to the, I don't know, the next prime number from the current date element in the string. Like, I want to do the most obtuse thing I can think of. 
not just in my text editor, but in all data structures. For example, my pilot logbook. Um, and, and again, if, if you do know anything about um, pilot logbooks, um, you'll get questions that, that go something like this. They'll go, um, you know, uh, hey, did you, what aircraft over a thousand kilos did you fly last week? And you'll be like, well, that's a filter operation. But what you'll really see is like you walk into the flight base and there'll be someone there with a pen on a monitor doing this counting and with a pen and paper, like writing it down. And I make a mistake. I go, oh, no, no, I, I, not the ones on Tuesday. I'm like, oh, I've got to recount it. <laughs> that's how, this kind of thing really goes on. And then they put the wrong number down and they submit it. And... <sighs> These questions get asked all the time and errors happen all the time, believe me. Ah, fortunately, logbooks don't matter too much. <laughs> the other bits on aeroplanes do. <laughs> All right, what about a programming language? Move to my programming language. Go, go into my Python source file and find all things that have an identifier name where B is in the third position and change it to as Q. Who argues about identifier names at work? <laughs> like, it should be a B. No, it should be a Q. The third letter should be a B. Just write the function. Use a zipper. <laughs> like just navigate down the whole tree of your, whatever it is, syntax tree. Find all of the identifier names. Navigate to the third element in that list zipper. And change the focus. It's one line of code. Right? You, instead of having arguments, we'll just write our two lines of code and move on. Go and have a coffee or something. Now you just go and have commit wars, right? Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really what happens, isn't it? <clears throat> um, just another example. Um, this is my workstation at work. This is, uh, who's heard of Xmonad? You probably, a few people are probably running it. It's a window manager. These are my windows. Uh, I guess I'm looking at a map for something. Um, but th this is a zipper. Move there, move there, move there, move there. That's a zipper. It's written using a zipper. <clears throat> it's another example. How Pardon? How so, how so is, so you're just focusing on, are these all the uh, window? Or no, no. So see how there's a pink border here? That's the focus. In fact, you can see it here because it really is the focus. This is, this is on this machine here. <clears throat> so this pink here is the focus. And I can navigate around my windows using keystrokes to mean move left, move right. There's, you, can, you can use a tree actually rather than a list. Um, that's, that's how I work. I work using a zipper. I'm sure other X1 ad users in the room do as well. Yep. So moving left or right is of one super fast, but yep. you're talking about operations where you want to suddenly jump way over here and get mm -hmm. a new focus. How, how do you do that? Um, be super inefficient. It, you know, it would be linear, right? Like if if I had like a line of, it, it depends how it's implemented. There's different layouts in Xmonad. Um, but suppose I wrote a linear one and I said like move to the fifth one over there, it would run in time five, yeah. <clears throat> but you know, if you go and open up the code to Xmonad and have a look, you'll see a zipper there for moving around the windows. <clears throat> um, this is a common question. Um, so I've put it in and uh, I'm gonna talk about it a bit. So some, uh, I get this question, which is, you know, like I've got this intuition for lenses. Why would I use a zipper and not a lens? Like what are the, what's the difference? And I'll tell you what the difference is. I'll give you like the, the difference in the intuition. <clears throat> um, so for example, in a tree, I can take it. Uh, yeah, that's not a good point. Skip that. Um, a zipper gives you context. All right. So... Um, as we navigate down the list and we get, so if I said to you something like, go to the list, go, get, you know, go move right across the list, zipper, find the first prime number, and when you get there, go back left one and add 10. All right, so we'd go and find the first prime number, move back one, and then add 10 on my focus. As I'm moving through the zipper, I have context of the complete structure. Whereas a lens, I don't have that context. So if I asked you to write that with a lens only, you would, or, or something like a lens, you would say, go all the way down the structure and find the first prime number. And then you'd have to like store the index or something like this, like try to somehow save that context. 
Then you'd come all the way back again. Then you'd go, I'll go all the way to that context except for one bit. And then modify it. Because you don't, you don't have that context as you're going down with a zipper, uh, with a lens. And, and all lens-like things. Okay, so that, that's the intuitive difference. If you have to go and do a context-dependent operation, that's when you use a zipper. So, for example, I need to know what that number is up, that that prime number is, so that I know when to move back one. I need the context as I go. So it's, it's your getting to the value and then saying, do you pass this predicate? Now, I know where in the structure it is. Let me just reach it to that. Yeah. You, okay. you, yeah. So as, when you get to the focus, you have the full context now. You, like, you want the context of having, been, having found that thing. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, whereas a lens will just say, yeah, it's there. And, and, that's, and then that's it. That's the end of the thing. You have to come all the way back again and, and try to save that context and go again. Um, so um, lenses are for viewing one hole in a, in a data type, just like, just like zippers are. But zippers keep context. Um, and traversals... Um, uh, zero or many holes. Um, I, can, I can talk all day about those if you like. That's not what we're here for, right? But zi zippers, so think about lenses like it's one hole inside a structure, but you get no context. Traversals is zero or many holes in a structure and you still get no context. A, zip, a, a one hole context zipper is one hole and you do get context. Pardon me. And there are n hole zippers where you keep the context. Um, yeah, so for example, we can view and operate on one thing inside this structure, which is the Y. We get no context about the Y. We don't know what's either side. We don't know about the X and the, and the Z on the side there. A traversal is zero on many Ys within there, but we still get no context. We don't know anything about what happens on either side of those Ys. Whereas a zipper, we can just keep, we can, as we go through here, we get the full context as we're moving through it. We can look at, at either side of us. Yeah, you can. Yep. Um, take JSON, for example, right? Like JSON is an object or an array or a string or a bool or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is like for that particular data type, if we move to a string, let's say, that's it. You can't go any further. Where if we move to an, uh, like an array, we can then say, well, move to the array, then move four to the right, then go down to my children, then move on to a key to find an object or you know we can keep navigating down right. yeah <clears throat> and we keep the context as we go so we know where we've been we can look back up and see where we've been is that triple a, a, a zipper can you make a zipper out of a triple <sighs> yeah good question i'm going to answer that um the answer is yes um but i think a, a, another question is well how do you do that so <laughs> let me do that um, who went to um, Emily and uh, Alex's talk yesterday? Cool. So you know all about the algebra and algebraic data types. Some, some of you didn't put your hands up, and that's okay. Don't sweat. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, so algebraic data types are called algebraic data types because they correspond to algebra. And by algebra, I mean the algebra that you learned you know, when you were 10 years old at school, that algebra. Some types do addition. And uh, it's commonly called either. I think in most programming languages these days, it's called that. Product types or tuples or, you, or pairs, they correspond to multiplication. Product types. <coughs> multiplication. Exponentiation. I think this one doesn't get talked about as often and can be a little bit hard to hold in your head. If I ever have given an A, this is a, this is a type, right? Given an A, return a B. I'm saying B to the power of A. Unit, that's one. Okay, so if I, if I write a data type with one value that can ever possibly exist, I've written unit. And if I write a data type that can never have a value, that's called void, often, that's zero. We have the building blocks for algebra. I'm going to do some algebra. Okay, here's or, right, this is Haskell syntax. When, when I have a constructor and it has no arguments, that is the same as having one argument of type unit. All right, I can construct it with unit and I can get the unit back out again. All right? Like if I, if I said data bool equals true unit or false unit, I have written a data type that is of the same structure as bool. Does everyone agree with that? 
I've said one unit or one. Bool is one or one. It's a unit or unit. Right? Is everyone cool with that? So, so let, let's just be clear on what unit is. It is the data type that has only one possible value. Its source code is data unit equals unit. It has one constructor, that constructor has no arguments. That's it. If I change this code to data bool equals true unit or false unit, that's the same thing as a bool. When I construct true, I'd say true and then pass in the unit value. When I get it back out again, I just throw away the unit value. And same for false. So I have said bool carries one or one. And or is plus, it's a sum type. Bool is two. Isn't that amazing? Not yet, it's just two. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you, and it, it carries no other data. Right, it carries, it carries a unit on one side and a unit on the other. One plus one, it's two. Well, what's maybe A? Well, nothing carries unit, right? It's got nothing in there, in, the, in its constructor. So it's unit plus A. It's one plus A. If I ever said to you, hey, what's maybe three? You'd say four, right? What's maybe bull? It's three, right? If I ever said to you, what is one plus three? Oh, sorry, one plus bull, which is two, you'd say three. Maybe bool is three. Another way of looking at that is, I'm thinking of a type, of a value of the type maybe bool. I'll give you three guesses. You'll definitely get it correct. Unless you answer the same thing. Yeah, yeah, you could be silly. That would be silly. You'd say nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah. <clears throat> So void is zero, so this, the source code for void is data void. It has no constructors, you cannot construct it. So looking at this data type here, either, either being plus void A. So I have said zero plus A. That's A, right? If I'm thinking of a value of the type either void bool, if that's the same thing as saying I'm thinking of a bool, I can't be thinking of a left because I can never construct a void to put it in there. So I'm thinking of either right true or right false. All right, I can't construct a left because I can't construct a void to put it in the left. So zero plus A equals A. I'm thinking of the pair or the product of void and A. That's a lie. Why is it a lie? Well, because zero times A is zero. I can't be thinking of a value of that type. I challenge you to construct it. You're going to make one. I challenge you. I'll give you another sticker if you can do it. Is this valid though? Is it you as usual like type? Sorry? Is this just a conceptually type level that we're talking about? So would we ever use this in practice? Yes. Well, would I use it in practice? All day long. Um, you and I are working on a team together. We're writing some Haskell. We're about to solve the world's problems. And I see you write this type. I immediately do a calculation and I say, you've just written A. That's a trivial example, but I can calculate it very simply. You've just done zero plus A. And from this, I can make inferences. All right, because I know that zero plus A is A. And I can just talk about it as if it's A. I'll give you a more complicated one. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll get into um, how this relates to zippers is, is probably a, a more interesting question. Here, here is, I think, slightly less trivial. Do you all agree that two times two is equal to two plus two is equal to two to the power of two? Does everyone agree with those, that? It's all four, that is all four. I'm thinking of something of the type bull to bull. I'll give you four guesses. There's the identity, there's negation, there's always return true, and there's always return false. There are no other functions of that type. There are four. 
And same for these. I'm thinking of an either bull bull. I'll give you four guesses. Left true, left false, right true, right false. It's four. This is how I use it. When I see this type, I go, oh, that's four. I look inside the code and I know which of the four. They're all four. And these things, these uh, values that inhabit the types, these programs that have that type are called the inhabitants. So we might say something like, this type has four inhabitants. Well, it has bool to the power of bool, right? Here's a slightly uh, trickier one. Oh, maybe I should have hidden that number there. How many does that have? <laughs> well, let's work it out. One plus two is three. Three to the power of two. Oh, sorry. Uh, three to the power of... Why have I got three there? Three to the power of two is um, nine. And one plus. Maybe you meant maybe bull to maybe bull. Yeah, I think I screwed that bit up. It's ten. Ah, uh, yeah, I think I did. Oh, actually, sorry, it's three to the power of two plus one. It's ten. Yeah, that, okay, let's just do the hard one. <laughs> the equation one, but the number's correct. I make mistakes. Like this one time in 1987. <laughs> so either, so zero plus two multiplied by 1 times 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 plus 2 plus 2 should be 40. So you and I are working away and we're writing, I don't know, the bank software or whatever we're writing and you write this type, I don't know why you would write that type, but suppose you did, I go, oh, you wrote 40. I can calculate it. I have some tests to write to, to test which of the 40 things you wrote. Okay, what's a list of A? Algebraically. Who said one plus A? It's close. A. Do you agree that it's either zero A's, or one A, or two A's, or three A's, and so on? It's a to the power of zero plus a to the power of one plus a to the power of two and so on. It's a series. But a to the power of zero meaning I've got no a's. a to the power of one meaning I've got one a's. a to the power of two meaning I've got a times a. I've got two a's and so on. It's this series here. And we can actually simplify this equation. Like there's hand waving in between that bit. Like we can get from this to this. And in fact, if you, if you know more about lists, you'll know that list is either nil, nil carrying unit, or a head and a tail. That's what a list is. It's one, but, it, but this is recursive, right? Like I haven't told you what a list really is. I've had to use list to tell you what a list is. I haven't really told you yet. Me neither. Don't worry. <clears throat> We're in this together, man. <clears throat> okay, now someone asked earlier, can, can, can we uh, do, uh, I think it was a triple of X. Um, this is similar, though. So algebraically, this is X plus X squared. Right? X plus the product of these two things. X plus X times X. There it is. Let's differentiate it, or a partial derivative. There it is. So we apply the sum rule. We end up with this. We apply these two rules, the power rule and the line rule. I'm going to hand wave them, because if I try to do it up here on a stage, I'm going to bust. I did do it on paper at home. And we end up with 1 plus 2 times x. That's the derivative, or the partial derivative, of that equation. 1 plus 2 times x. 1 plus 2 times x. This is the derivative of that. <clears throat> now, I couldn't get this graph to work out. Like, it, it rendered wonky. 
but this is meant to be over here, right? And uh, yeah, there you go. There you see either x and the pair of x and x, and there you see its derivative, yep. Cool, cool. Let's not do another one then. You can keep going. Oh, there's yours. It's x times x times x. Differentiate it, it's three times x squared. It looks like that. Three times x squared. So we can differentiate these data types and get this. Isn't that cool? <coughs> Why would I ever do differentiation? I've got web apps to write. <clears throat> the derivative of any structure is its zipper. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> now we're walking around with our three x's. We take the derivative. Now we've got the zipper. Without the one whole context. Yeah, so let's let's... Let's do it intuitively, right? I have three x's, and ignore, so the one whole context being my focus, this is enough information to know where inside that those three x's I am, okay? This says which of the three that I'm standing on, and this will say the, the other two, except for the one that I'm standing on, all right? So it doesn't include the context. So all I've got to do is add it back in, all right? So the zipper for this is this comma x, like the focus as well. Isn't that great? I can take the derivative of a, less, a list and get a list zipper. Let's do it. Because I've only got, what, three minutes or something. Um, okay, there's a list. One plus a plus a squared. That's a list. I have no, no a's, one a, two a's, three a's. There it is there. <clears throat> it's one plus that series. Uh, yeah, so we, ju we just got back to there again, right? So that's nil or the head and the tail. Okay, so... If I multiply both sides by, uh, what have I done there? Multiply both sides by this one here. Yeah, one here. Apply a distributive law, I'll end up with this equation here. And then I divide both sides by one minus a. Is that right? Yeah, I'll, I'll end up with, and then apply exponent rule, I'll end up with one minus a to the power of negative one. Therefore, a list is this thing. I didn't tell you about negative, I told you about sums and products and exponentiation. I don't need to tell you about negative. Because when I differentiate this equation, I end up with, um, I end up with uh, one minus a on both sides anyway, so I can just cancel them. <coughs> I end up with this, when I take the derivative of a list. Uh, there, uh, where did I end up with it? Here. So, yeah, so if you, I let, did I let you back there, right? U is 1 minus A. Look, I've got like two minutes. I end up with the derivative of a list is list squared. That's a pair of lists. And then I put the focus back in. So there it is, there's the derivative, and I put the focus back. That's the list zipper, that's what I told you at the start. So I, if you didn't know what it is, you would have said, hang, hold right there, I'm just going to do some calculus. And you would have done that, and you go, there it is, that's what a list zipper is. It's that. Um, oh yeah, <clears throat> if I had time I was going to do some exercise, but I don't. Um, I do have some exercises like tree zippers. Let's take the derivative of a tree, that's pretty fun, etc., etc. So um, I'll leave it there. Thanks for your time. <clears throat>